Hello, humanity. This is the Peer-to-Peer -peer Unconditional Income Movement. I'm Zachary Weaver, founder of the Creative Wealth Community. With me is Sathvik Vasam, founder of Go All in Agency. Today, we have the honor and pleasure of interviewing Professor Carl Weiderquist. Carl is a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, Qatar, with a background as an economist. He writes on many topics, but he's best known for his work on basic income. In fact, the Atlantic Monthly has called him a leader of the worldwide basic income movement. So to learn more about Carl, please follow him at widerquist.com, read his bio in the description, and watch our previous interview with him. Carl, thank you so much for speaking with us. Hey, great to be back. You're uh, dialing in from Doha, is that right? From, from the Middle East? That's right. I'm in Doha, Qatar, where I teach at Georgetown University satellite campus here. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, we're excited about the, the, the questions for today. Zach, you want to take it away? Yeah, we're going to ask some questions about what's required to make universal basic income a reality. Um, and so just as a baseline, my understanding is that no country is doing a full UBI yet. Um, Carl, are there any countries that you feel are closer than other, others? Well, the state of Alaska is doing a uh, doing a small UBI or a partial UBI. There's, I'm writing about the definition of basic income right now. That's something you guys should interview about, but uh, not just me, but a bunch of people. I, I might want to do a panel interview on that. Um, the, uh, the definition, and uh, some people use the term full to mean enough to live on, and partial is mean smaller than enough to live on. And, and Alaska has a dividend that's given out once a year to every every res every legal resident who fills out a form to verify their legal residency uh which makes it practically a UBI the filling out the form makes it diverge more than you would think from a UBI because the form is a hassle and uh and a lot of a lot of homeless people don't don't fill out the form every year um, but that is the closest thing in the world that I know of to uh, basic income right now. Um, and it uh, one of the things that it's only a yearly payment. Um, so it's it's uh, it's much smaller than we'd like to see and uh, and it's much less regular. It's also a yearly payment that goes up and down with the investment portfolio of all of the, uh, the 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 sovereign wealth fund in Alaska that funds it, but it's a very good program, and it is it is otherwise unconditional. You fill out that form, every man, woman, and child. You don't even have to be a citizen if you're a legal resident from another country, and, and but you meet the residency requirement, mean which means you have like a green card and you're living there for at least uh, at least so many years. Um, you you get this with everybody else, and if you're living on the margins and you get a check. Say you're you're a single mother with four kids, and suddenly you get a check for ten thousand dollars, two thousand dollars for for each member of your family. That makes a huge difference for you. And uh, we did some studies uh, about ten years ago about the impact that it's had on Alaska, and it's helped it, help it become one of the most equal states in the United States, one of the most prosperous. Um, and there's been no measurable negative effects on growth or anything like that. Um, now, Iran had a policy that was like a basic income. They used to have, now Iran and Alaska have one thing in common, that they are, that uh, they're, both, they're both oil exporters and they have this big windfall uh, from the oil that, that they export. There's a lot of other things that that states export that they don't take control of the way they tend to with things like oil. But uh, they were using it for a really dumb thing. I think this went back to like the early days of oil exploration um, 80 years ago or 100 years ago, whenever they started drilling in Iran, was they like, well, um, we can get really, really cheap oil to Iranians. So they were using an enormous amount of their profits from oil in order to subsidize oil revenue for Iranians. Uh, 
and they uh, which which of course distorted markets and and uh, made people drive too much, and it was a questionable. But it was hard to get rid of that. It's hard to get rid of that subsidy without giving the people something else. And what they settled on eventually was pretty much a basic income, uh, which had some good aspects to it. And some bad. one bad aspect to it is that everyone living in Iran was benefiting from the oil subsidies, but they only gave the basic income to citizens. And Iran has a lot of non-citizens living there. So, and and a lot of some of them are refugees. Some of them are from Afghanistan and other troubled places. And so, a lot of the neediest people living in Iran were just cut out from this. That was one thing that went bad. Another thing is they gave it to the head of the household instead of to every individual, which of course gives already the most powerful person in the household more power over everybody in the household. And you think, oh, well, in my house, everybody loves each other. Okay, well, not all, how, and we all, doesn't matter who you give it to, we're all going to share it. Well, not every household is like that. Not every household in any country is like that. Some heads of households are, are tyrannical, and this is usually men who control the finances, and you're giving them more power. Um, but then there was a problem. This happened, what, was it about 10 years ago in when they did this in Iran? But then Iran had some bad monetary policies, and they let inflation eat up a lot of this. Um, so I've kind of lost track of that policy. Um, and the the other one that I would go to would be uh, one that people don't usually talk of, talk about when they talk about basic income. But um, Norway has a sovereign wealth fund that funds a lot of things because Norway's super rich with exports, but they use a lot of their sovereign wealth fund for a citizen's pension, which, well, you're like, well, we have social security. That's for the citizens. It's not a citizen's pension because not everybody's eligible for social security. And um, your eligibility varies by how much money you've earned. So it actually, uh, social security, though it helps some of the most needy, it does um, it does uh, cause a bunch of inequalities to persist into retirement. Women, uh, elderly women are much more likely to be living in poverty than elderly men because of Social Security's rules. Um, and, and there's other problems. With it. There's so, everybody gets a different amount because of various factors. In Norway, this citizen's pension, once you get to this age, you get this money and it's enough to live on. Uh, so it's like a basic income for the elder. That's what a citizen's pension is. That is a really important step toward a basic income. Um, and then the after that, I would just go to look looking at the well. There's there's conditional trans cash transfers that are going on in Brazil, both Amelia, but also all over uh, all over the global south. You've got a lot of these conditional cash transfers, which um, are conditional and they're targeted at the poor, but They've reduced the eligibility requirements. The conditions are made easier and easier. So they're a big step in the direction of UBI. And these have been showing, uh, these have been showing that moving in the direction of UBI helps people. It reduces poverty, gives people more flexibility and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things, although there is no UBI in the world, there's actually, when you start to list them, there's a lot of things moving in that direction. You can also look at just any country that has has a generous redistributive system. Um, Canada's a little more generous than the United States, um, and the Nordic country, but Western Europe in general is more generous than Canada, and the Nordic country is more generous still. Uh, and you find you've got a lot less social problems the more generous they are and the less conditions they are, all of which indicates that moving in the direction of basic income is a good step to go in. It's interesting, uh, Carl, when you talk about you know, different countries implementing it with sovereign wealth funds, and then some mm -hmm. are, you know, uh, and, and some are focusing on citizens, others are focusing on residents. Like, uh, have you seen what, is it kind of specific to each country, what works better for them? Or is there, are there certain general principles that would work across all of them or all of the other countries that could uh, start thinking about this as well? Well, 
sovereign wealth funds are good if you're if if you if you're uh, having a temporary revenue, something that's going to give you temporary revenue that uh, you want to that you want to uh, you get this big windfall, but you know it's going to be temporary. You don't want to smooth that out. Alaska knew this knew this revenue wasn't going to last forever. So some of the more far-sighted Alaskans were saying, let's put all of this or most of this into a sovereign wealth fund and keep pretty much everything else the same. Um, and other people will say, well, we, there are some things that we really need right now, like infrastructure and better schools. We got to use some of that for that. We don't have any business, you know, saving for the future. We don't have decent infrastructure. But then there were other people who were like, let's get rid of the, let's get rid of the income tax. Well, you get rid of the income tax and you help middle and lower class people very little. Uh, and you help, uh, you help the upper middle class and the, and the wealthy a lot. Um, and that's what they did with most of their revenue. Um, so, so a sovereign wealth fund is very good if you're trying to smooth it. And so they did, they have a sovereign wealth fund and, and, and it's, it's giving them this, but they should have put more money into that sovereign wealth. Um, same is true with, with anybody that's exporting something they know to be finite, like oil. Um, a sovereign wealth fund is a good strategy. Um, otherwise, but, but a lot of things that people export are, uh, where they don't treat the same way as they do oil. Anything you mine, anything you do, uh, could be used to support a sovereign wealth fund, but also it's not the only valuable resource. Uh, one of the good, one thing that every country in the world has is valuable real estate and the real estate can't go anywhere. So you tax the landlords. And you redistribute that to everybody as a basic income. And then the landlord's profits go down and everybody else is better off at affording housing. And the people, the person who owns their property outright, who owns their property outright is going to be, uh, is going to be, uh, with depending if it's a cheap property, you're going to be better off with this. If it's a very expensive property, worse off. But if you're in the middle, you have the average house, it's probably that kind of thing would would kind of be a wash for you. You'd get as much in the basic income as you'd pay in the taxes at some point. But uh, the um, it it's it's it it would also in somebody who owes a lot of money on their house it would be very good for them because it's come the profits from the it's going to be what who this is really going to harm is the well financially harm. Uh, not physically harm them and not maybe existentially harm them because it gives them a better society to live in. But it's going to landlords and banks who are making lots and lots of money off of the fact that people can't afford land right now. Those as it, those are the people that are, that are going to, that are going to lose in this. And those are the, those are some of the big drivers of inequality, landlords and banks. That's something any country in the world can do. Any country in the world can tax its assets. Uh, to tax, tax its natural resources and redistribute that. And any country that has inequality can find very various different ways to target the wealthiest people, the big dynastic families that are passing their money on generation to generation, ta finding ways to tax that group and uh, have a larger basic income for everybody else. Mm, makes sense. Um, there's a couple different uh, uh, avenues yeah. of which I thought we could uh, I could ask a follow up question to that. One is, what maybe maybe I can go down this route first. Um, you said real estate. So are there is there a precedence mm -hmm. perhaps for uh, countries to tax certain industries like big tech or the energy industry uh, and use some of those funds for um, you know, to provide for the citizens. That's one avenue in w w which I'd like to talk about. The other one that I was thinking of is also, um, is this something, you know, I guess what kind of, um, what could governments start doing or thinking about to even start allowing natural resources and real estate to be, um, uh, the, the value of that to be captured to pass along to the citizens more. So, um, maybe whichever question resonates with you, you can you can answer first. Well, I mean the the 
Well, one other thing to rule about taxation, uh, uh, the functional finance, modern monetary people will jump on us. We don't, we don't stress the fact that you're not actually using the money. What you're doing is you're using the taxes to counteract the, the inflationary effects of basic income. You give people basic income that pushes up prices. You tax people that pushes down prices as it may get as uh, as it gives them. They've got to go and they they they've uh, they've got to reduce what else whatever else they're buying to pay their taxes. That's going to just that's this encourages buying by by giving the basic income, discourages buying by taxing people, um, by taxing people. So you want to, um, uh, so you're actually, so you're actually, it's actually really about inflationary effects than, rather than literally using the money. However, it's so much easier to just talk about using the money, which, uh, which is why most people do it, um, no matter how well they understand what the functional finance idea behind uh, taxation is. The, what you want to do with taxes is, to, you know, so taxes are a tool to affect behavior and and so what you want to do is tax things that you want to discourage you want to discourage um pollution tax pollution you want to discourage greenhouse gases to tax the emission of greenhouse gases tax uh tax uh pollution in the rivers tax pollution in the air tax pollution in the ground um tax land value because you want to you want to you want to you want to discourage people from just speculatively pushing up the price of land, parking their money in land, and just hoping that the land value will, will, will ever increase and charging higher and higher rents to everybody else. You want to discourage that. Land taxes are a very good way to discourage it. You just you 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 tax what you want to discourage. Now, when you say should we tax the tax industry, well, that's a pretty broad thing. There's a lot going on in the tech industry. Some of it's great. Some of it I don't want to discourage. Um, I don't want to discourage. Uh, I want to discourage that people are, are are trying to make high speed rail with high tech stuff. That I don't want to discourage. But um, I in the tech industry I do want to discourage um, people having software that we know has addictive properties that is trying to get all of us, including our children. To get addicted to checking their phones every time, every now and then, that kind of stuff. We want to, if we don't want to outright ban it, then we want to tax it and find a way. Maybe tax advertising. We don't need. Uh, there's really a limit to how much we really need advertising. We could tax a lot of advertising. Uh, we could tax some of the high tech tactics that are targeting people. You could tax also a lot of um, a lot of people in the food industry are got, trying to get us addicted to unhealthy food tax their efforts to do that. Anything that's bad for people, you want to tax. Tax, you know, we've been taxing alcohol for, uh, for what, 200 years? I don't know how long. That's something we want to discourage, excessive use of alcohol. That's what we've been discouraging. We want to take that model to a lot of other things that should be discouraged and keep the taxes low on the things we don't want to discourage, such as, such as building uh, high-tech green transportation. We don't want to tax we don't want to tax the high tech use of, say, solar power or wind power or something like that. Fantastic answer, thank you, Carl. Covered both covered both questions there. And, and if you do that, there's so. If you think about what are all the things we want to discourage, well, we don't want to discourage big dynastic families. That's a lot of stuff to tax. We want to discourage high land speculation. That's a pollution. All of this stuff that adds up to a lot of stuff you can tax. That's really. Uh, that's really going to depress. That's really going to depress the spending of the wealthiest people, which gives us the opportunity to use basic income. To you got your deflationary aspect of taxing those people. You can have a pretty big basic income to counteract that off by encouraging the spending of the people who are least advantaged, which also we want to do: get people out of poverty. So, mm -hmm. what? Oh, what do you feel is hindering? countries from adopting a universal basic income or 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 adopting more things like it it feels like maybe they're going in that direction from from what you're saying when you're adding up all of these um programs around the world but um but but what's getting in the way of of moving of moving faster like the countries with the most generous 
welfare systems are also the economies with that are the most democratic. Those are the countries where the government is most responsive to the people. Finland, Norway, Iceland, Denmark to some extent, the Netherlands and others, uh, and to a, Sweden not as much as it used to be, uh, not as much certainly not as much as it was fifty years ago. A lot of, uh, uh, they've kind of been bucking the trend of of the Nordic countries lately, but they're they're still still much more generous and much more democratic than than many other countries. Um, is that is in the United States, money is more valuable than votes. Um, and people think, well, we ultimately vote. The only way you can get into office is get people to vote for you. Well, that's true. But the only way people are going to find out about you, find out that you're running for nomination by your party in the primaries for whatever you're running for, is to get a bunch of rich people behind you. Um, so the rich people decide who the viable candidates are. And then the people decide which of these people approved by the rich are good for us. And it's, it is quite clear, uh, quite clear looking, if you look at the stats on what influence, what, what influence, well, what, what is correlated with votes in Congress and what eventually gets to be laws is that whether the ma a majority of the whole of the voting population supports something or not is not highly correlated with whether the government adopts it. What's highly correlated with it is how do the wealthiest 10% feel about a policy um, and the um, feel about a policy. Um, and that really shows that what they're doing is what they're doing is accommodating the donor class. And this is also obvious from 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 just from rational uh, decision maker. If it wasn't true that donations are really important to to getting people elected um, or to something else that that uh, elected officials want, elected officials wouldn't be spending so much of their time raising money that's what elect that's what our elected officials spend most of their time doing raising money and a lot of our unelected official people are just trying to get elected they spend loads and loads of time raising money um uh, because they know that's what's important not satisfying the average voter but getting money from the donor class um and then the other way to look at it is look at why do these donors give all that money they would not be giving all of that money if it wasn't buying them influence or getting things done the way they want it in Washington and in all of our state capitals around the country. Money is controlling our politics. Um, and that can be, uh, I mean, there's sometimes people with money make good decisions, um, but that's not democracy. It's not democracy when people with money are controlling everything. That that has really got to change. Um, and that's that's something that's kind of sad for me because I I I I I have dedicated my research career to what when I was younger thought was the biggest problem that the United States had, which was which was poverty and inequality. Um, and I realized there's this other problem of money in politics that is like a barrier to solving the problem that I see as most. So this is a more basic problem that I'm not working on. Um, and there's a lot of people out there working on it, and we these people need to succeed. The people who are trying to get money out of politics really have to succeed, succeed for anything else to succeed. Of course, we've got a lot of other problems in American politics, uh, the polarization for the two parties and the fact that that um, Republicans uh, are are willing to disenfranchise voters and and uh, and are doing a lot of anti-democratic things right now. Um, moving us away from, from what little democracy we have, moving us away from it. We have all of those problems too, but this basic problem where money's controlled politics is not new. It didn't something that didn't con just come along with Citizens United, uh, what was that, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, that made it worse, but it's been around for years and years and years and years, and it's been getting worse and worse. And this is a bad thing for any country. Uh, one of the things that, if you look at the history of when countries go into decline, 
um, whether it's a Roman Empire or or uh, or uh, medieval Venice or whatever country you're talking about, they tend to go into decline when their political system gets more and more built around giving giving uh, giving things away to political insiders. When what they're trying to do is to give perks for insiders, then uh, they have little to do anything else that's 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 worth doing. And so much of our political system in the United States is giving perks to insiders. You probably have pennies in your pocket right now. You have pennies because which we should have stopped minting years and years ago, decades ago, half a century ago with inflation. Uh, but we keep buying them because the company that makes the pennies gives the donations in Congress and buys buys the 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 they buy the congressmen who then buy the pennies. Um, and so much of our system is like that. I think Obama was really trying to do good with Obamacare. But what he had to do was in order to get that passed, he had to have so many goodies in it for the for-profit health care and the, do the donors, um, who the donors who were going to, if they came out against it, he was never going to get anything passed. He had to have all these goodies in it for the donor class. And then so we can't really solve the deep underlying problems in our healthcare system because of that, and in so many of other things, a lot of our defense is not what the de defense department needs, what would donors want to sell to the government? I, I was gonna ask Carl, have you heard of American Promise? Sounds like you might have it. They're an organization um, that they're they're moving for a constitutional, a constitutional amendment that would allow Congress and the states to set reasonable limits on, on campaign spending. That sounds great. Um, but uh, it, with the, the polarization in the United States, it's really impossible to uh, pass uh, pass a constitutional amendment on anything uh, about now. Um, but it sounds like a great effort. It also seems to me like Congress. It seems to me, without going as far as 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 a constitutional amendment, I I don't uh, I don't know if this would work, but. Um, it seems to me Congress could just make a simple rule saying, if you get money from somebody, you have to recruit yourself from voting on anything that is related to that person. You take money from a corporation, you cannot vote on anything that's going to affect that corporation. Uh, you take money from a wealthy person, you cannot vote on anything that's going to have a, a substantial effect on that that wealthy person. Um, and you know, over say donations over a certain amount, like a thousand dollars or something. Um, and uh, whether it's soft money or hard money, whatever these distinctions are, it, all of it, you just make a rule, you got to recuse yourself. Uh, I don't know, if, if, but if you did that, if I don't know if that's constitutional or whatever, but if you did that, if you actually had to recuse people, that would take away the incentive for people to give these huge amounts. And then it would take away the incentive for people to spend all their time trying to, for uh, our our senators and our representatives spending all their time raising this kind of money. Yeah, I would love to follow up with with America Promise to see if that's um, yeah. what they think about the viability of that rule. Um, yeah, but um, but going back to to what you what you said, it sounds like what is what's what would allow universal basic income to move forward from your perspective is probably more democracy, more yes. A more democratic um, system. So, um, what? Well, maybe, maybe this is this might be out of outside of your expertise. But you know, with that in mind, what um, what mentalities or, or ways of thinking uh, do you personally feel have to change for a country to, you know, become more democratic and and implement? Yeah, that that is out of my area of expertise. Okay. I don't know. Uh, of course, you also need other things. You need you need attitudes to change. We need a better feeling of solidarity across class and race. A lot of uh, a lot of progressive things we won't do because people are uh, people have this belief that anybody who's non-white is is a bad person and this is going to benefit that bad person. Um, and they won't say that. They might not even feel it consciously. Um, but so many of our stuff is written is written to uh, uh, is written to exclude uh, black people, Native Americans, and many other people of color. Uh, 
And you find that in uh, in South Africa, where they actually had the during the apartheid period, where they actually were able to just they, they had this really screwed up system where you could just simply say this program is only for white people. When they did that, they had a really generous welfare system for white people. Um, and and uh, which to some extent, uh, to a limited extent, when the uh, when when the non-race based government came into power, they were able to just extend some of those problem programs and get get some aspects of their uh, of their welfare system improved just dramatically with that. It's uh, of course there's been a lot of problems in South Africa since then, but uh, that was one good thing that happened. They were able to think, well, these programs that are just for white people now they're for everybody. Well, if we get to the point where we stop thinking, well, how do we make sure that my image of a bad black person isn't going to benefit from this program because I have solidarity with anybody who's suffering, then we can get, I think, a lot more generousness in our programs. That really answers, I think, one of or or speaks to one of the questions we got from a listener of of our previous yeah. interview with you, which mm -hmm. uh, was, you know, how do you how do you feel net contributors will feel about being a net contributor? I, I kind of feel like you've, you've answered that somewhat, but is there more you would like yeah. to say to that? Yeah, well, um, the kind of basic income that I'd like to see would, would, ha would make 70% of people at any given moment net contributors. If you had uh, what I calculated, it was a $20,000 basic income, with a a fifty percent uh fifty percent marginal tax rate on income, uh, which I did just not that that's the best system, but that's the easiest one to calculate with the very simple uh simple tools I was using. You do that, you get seventy percent. I would like to see a really generous basic income like that um, um, just the poverty line is so low in the United States and so poorly calculated that you've got to do something that's higher than just at the poverty line. But uh, you do something like that, and 70% of people at any given time will be net contributors. Now, that also means that a lot of those people that at the moment are not net contributors will be, uh, I'm sorry, are net contributors. Certain 70% are net beneficiaries. I'm okay. sorry. I got yes, that all yes, backwards. 70% right. net beneficiaries. So the majority of people are benefiting from this change. We have a really generous one. Majority of people are benefiting from the change directly at any given moment. The majority of them are. Now, that leaves only 30% as net contributors. 70% net recipients and only 30% net contributors. Now, of, but of those 30%, a lot of those are going to be net contributors at, sorry, net beneficiaries at some point in their lives. And those points in their lives are going to be the most crucial times in their in their life. Um, I, if we had something like this um, throughout my past life, when I was a child, I don't think at any point that I know of my family would have been a net recipient. If so, only barely into the net recipient range and not for very long. But in my early adult years, when I was struggling, when I didn't have a decent job, uh, I uh, I would have been a net beneficiary, and that would have really helped me out. It would have also given given me a lot of better chances to do things like going to grad school without well, without having to do some uh, uh, do some distracting do a whole bunch of distracting work and really concentrate on building my skills. It would have helped me in enormous ways. And now I get to this point. Now I get to this point where I'm well into the net contributor range. I'm. Uh, I don't know how other people react, but I could say, yeah, this program helped me. It really helped me then. It really helped me then when I was in when I was when I was in need. And it's helped me get where I am. Yeah, I'm really enthusiastic about this program. And it might help me again when I retire. And things aren't so good for me. It, uh, aren't so good for me again. Um, so a lot of those net contributors will be net recipients for uh, for the crucial times in their life. So they have good reason to to uh, they have good reason to support it. Um, and then the people then you get to the people who well well uh, um, and some of them say, well, I don't care if it benefited me before uh, uh, 
I don't want anybody to benefit, anybody else to benefit from it. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some jerks like that, but I don't think those are going to be a huge number of people. The people, but the people who are, who are can be confident that I've never been a net beneficiary, and I'm very unlikely ever to be a beneficiary. These are the these are the top one percent. These are um, these are the people who these are the people who have so much wealth that they come from a dynastic family. Their parents were really well off when they were young. They had no poverty when they were young. They don't know poverty now. And they've got enough of the bank that they think they'll ne they, they, they have reason to believe they'll never know poverty in the future. I guess it could be some people with with uh, with top 30% jobs, uh, just barely top 30% jobs who are a bit overconfident. Could be some of those people. But, uh, but for the most part, the people that really can say, yeah, I'm never going to need this, that's like the top 1%. And if we don't give the top one percent um, a disproportionate um, a disproportionate power over our political system, we really got good reason for most of the people to say, "Yeah, I I can see how this benefits me, and I think I can see that it's good that it benefits my neighbors in the same way, no matter what color my neighbors are, you know, how no matter how suspicious I might be of my neighbors, it's going to help them the way it helped me." I thank you so much. I, I want to go into, I want to try to fit in one more audience or, or listener question and then go to Sothbit. Okay. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so we got one um, talking, uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to read this one. It's if, as in Carl's example, we gave people the power to say no to undesirable jobs with a UBI, and we were in a model where unpleasant jobs had to be fairly compensated to guarantee that there would be someone willing to fill those roles, who is covering those costs? Does the employer just make less of a profit or are the costs passed on to the consumers? I feel that part of the reason less skilled workers are underpaid is because they're seen as replaceable because there are so many of them. And we do really need them, but we need them in such numbers that the idea of truly making those jobs lucrative on that big of a scale seems like it must come at a cost to society in some way because that money has to come from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Well, there are uh, at least four things that that can come from. So uh, I have argued, as we talked about last time, basic income ought, ought to be large enough that people can refuse a bad job. The power to say no to a job that you judge is bad, I think is crucial to you being a free person. And this person has asked me about the effects of that in this question. So, um, so, and if you want to look realistically at, at, the U.S. economy and the worldwide economy, there are a lot of bad jobs out there. There are a lot of jobs that have that have uh, that have very low pay, that have poor uh, possibilities for moving up, and that have poor working conditions, and sometimes really uh, obnoxious, if not downright abusive bosses. And a lot of jobs that people really should be saying no to until those conditions improve. Improve, and I believe that should be their judgment. If it's if you want somebody to work for you, it's your responsibility as an employer to pay them enough that they want to work for you. That's what that's how free people negotiate with each other. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, so, and this is asking, well, what's going to happen with the with those jobs, and and and, and what's going to happen with those things? Well, I can think of at least four things that are going to that can happen with with, with those jobs. Uh, uh, one is the the pay can go up, and the pay can go up, and it could be reflected in higher prices. The pay could go up, and it could be reflected in lower profits. The pay pay could the pay could go up, and um and it is reflected in them in em employers either replacing or augmenting the labor with technology, in order to make it profitable. Or the employer could say, "Wow, you know, this is kind of a bullshit job to begin with. Maybe I, I, I maybe I just don't need this employee. Some of the crap that we're asking low-income people to do is crap that doesn't need to be done. Um, maybe Walmart doesn't need need a 75-year-old greeter who's only there because uh, because he he can't afford his basic living expenses because his Social Security is too low. Um, so." Some of those bullshit jobs are going to go away, and that's not a bad thing. Um, we make a lot of crap that we don't need, little trinkets, little plastic that is uh, destroying our environment.
Um, some of that stuff, if that if we produce less of that stuff, that's fine. Um, if uh, if um, wealthy people have fewer servants, that's fine. Um, and but then now, okay, so it, of course it is possible that some of these some of this these expenses are going to get passed on to consumers in the form of higher prices. Um, but it's not going to be across industry. It's not going to cause a, a general inflation. If you're discouraging spending on some types of goods, the goods we don't want people to consume, uh, like polluting goods and and land speculation and stuff like that, you're going to keep inflation in check with that. So it means some goods are going to get more expensive, but other goods are going to get less expensive um, uh, relatively to, to how much money people have. But so some goods will get more expensive and this will encourage people to replace labor with technology and things like that. But the but people are often very defeatist when they think they they don't really understand all the complexities. Well, no one understands the complexities of the economy very well, but people often take a look at that complexity and have a totally defeatist attitude, assuming that nothing will ever work. Is that, oh, you you get higher wages, they'll just pass that on. The, the the employers will pass that on and everybody will pay higher prices and and it won't change anything. It changes things because it's never just higher prices. As a matter of fact, a lot of it is in lower profits. Is that the profit rate is not something that is uniform over time and place. The inequality in society is not uniform over time and place. It and it varies with government policy. Inequality dropped in the United States from the 30s until the 1970s, and it did so because of government policy. Government policy doing things that how doing things to give workers more power to command higher wages and to take away corporations and other owners' power and the top echelons people, uh, top echelons of workers power to 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 command higher income. Policy can affect these things. And when you have uh, when you have people who are able to demand higher wages, some of that sacrifice, and very often I, I think a lot of that sacrifice is going to be lower profits for the for the most powerful monopolistic corporations that we have in the United States and the world. Every corporation that or operates in the United States, no matter where they're headquartered, is going to feel that 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 I've got to give good wages and good working conditions to get people to work for me. Um, yeah, some of that's going to get reflected in lower world prices. Uh, sorry, lower profits for all for these corporations that that operate here, and a substantial amount of it will. Thank you for these comprehensive answers, Carl. Uh, right. <laughs> is there? Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're fantastic. Um, uh, Sophic, uh, anything? Uh, I'm, I'm sure your mind is buzzing. Absolutely, yeah. Well. I feel like there's a few few answers here, Carl, that we could uh, probably save for a, a future interview. Uh, to that'd be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, me as an entrepreneur, you know, I I'm I'm, I'm reticent about you know policies which would lower my profits. Um, yeah. Right. Um, and 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 I understand that there's benefits uh, on a larger scale. You know, if workers are better taken care of and and um, you know that they're happier. You know that mm -hmm. impacts the uh, their output. The the impacts that impacts um, uh, their productivity uh, in the workplace. Um, and maybe they would want to stick around because it's like okay, well, the combination of what I'm earning from UBI and with my wages, this is actually a really good lifestyle. This is fine for me. Uh, and maybe I can negotiate being a part time worker instead of being a full time worker, and it's okay. You know, um, so. Um, if I could ask, though, um, are there certain um, are there certain structures of setting up a business uh, that would be more that that would work better with UBI? Um, I mean, we talk about you, know, you talk about Obamacare. Uh, you know that uh, helped many businesses because people you know that's something that did not have to come out of the employer's pockets. Right. So are there certain policies that could uh, work well with businesses' interests and consumers' interests with UBI um, and, and kind of like 
be more synergistic as well. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm sorry. Um, uh, it's, it's, also, it's also another thing about, you know, people will be defeatist about what's going to work, but they'll always, uh, when you talk about targeting the, the biggest, wealthiest corporations and their profits and stuff like that, or the biggest, wealthiest landlords, you know, people think about, well, what, what about the old lady that owns a giant farm and, 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 uh, doesn't really work. It just owns a bunch of land or they think about, well, what about the small business? Those, uh, that's not the people we're targeting. Uh, sure. If you got higher wages, that's going to make, that's going to make one expense more for every entrepreneur. Um, however, it doesn't make you any less competitive against all other entrepreneurs. Um, and it does a lot for you. Um, my brother and I, my brother and I were, uh, our, we, we actually are entrepreneurs. In fact, we are landlords. The very people I'm advocating more taxes on, we're small-scale landlords. We, uh, with the money I save working over here in, in, in Qatar, which is a big natural gas exporter and is one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, and so the, I, the incentive pay that I get to go over and live here, give to my brother, he buys houses, fixes them up, we rent them out. That's our business. Um, and so we're not just speculating on land. We are improving land and giving people places to live and stuff like that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be paying taxes more than we do. Uh, but we were one of the things that slowed us down in starting this business, well, two things going together, was that um, my brother had to make income when we started. Um, and... He had to have health care. Um, and so it took us, it took us several years of him working part time on our business while he was teaching in the South Bend, Indiana public schools, um, working part time to build up a, a business, uh, a real estate business, um, because he needed health care and he needed, uh, he needed at least some minimal income. Finally, after a few years, um, the business was doing well enough that we could pay him a decent salary and he could quit that job. Um, and uh, and that we could get him health care. If we had universal health care for every single person and we had a basic income for every single person, think of how much easier it would be to start a business. And I don't know how many, I don't know how many businesses have no employees, but a lot of businesses have zero employees. Only the member, only the, only the owner or only the owner's family work for a lot of our business, certainly for our smallest businesses. And a lot of them will have only one employee. Um, a basic income, even if wages are higher, will be very good for people going into business by themselves. Um, those who are literally by themselves. And it will be, and, and, um, and it won't make them any less competitive when they go out to look for labor. Um, they've, they're, they'll be in the same boat as everybody else trying to trying to buy that labor. And if we get the government doing things like like uh, making sure everybody has their health care needs met and we don't put that cost on the employer, um, I think we can have a, have a system that, that gives every worker the power to say no to a bad job, but is still a very friendly place for, for entrepreneurs to do business. Sounds fair. Uh, I, I I think the uh, like the the takeaway for me in, in this is this is worth trying, you know. This yeah. is worth trying at 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 and I would even say at scale to see you know mm -hmm. beyond just like a small community here. Okay, what what would a whole neighborhood? What would a whole city? What would a whole state look like with these kind of policies mm -hmm. implemented? Um, and 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 see how we can continue to benefit businesses. It, it doesn't have to be like okay, it's it's not a zero sum game. It's like oh, you take away from businesses, it's going to hurt consumers. Or, or it's going to benefit consumers or, or vice versa. It's like, oh, it's hopefully it's a, a rising tide that lifts all boats. That's my, that's my takeaway from your answer. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not fond of that expression because it is a weird expression because all the boats are at the same level to begin with. Um, uh -huh. There's big boats and small boats are all at the same level. You raise the tide, well, you still got big boats and small boats. Okay. Uh, it didn't do anything about inequality. <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a weird analogy. People love to use it, but. It's um, really weird. Um, uh, a rising tide doesn't make the the, the small boat that's bigger. Do you? And do you? The goal of the boat is also not to go up. 
<laughs> That's boats go good. across the water. They're, you know, you know what you want to raise airplanes. You don't really want to raise boats. Just right there on the surface. Noted. It, is that? Uh, do you do you substitute in the, uh, the creating a floor or raising the raising the floor for people when you talk about universal basic income? Yeah, yeah. Raising the floor, I, I, raising the floor is a good analogy. You know, uh, yeah. That was the uh, that was uh, a book that came out a few years ago. Who wrote that? Who whose book was that? I think it was Andy. Raising Stern. the floor. Andy Stern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great guy. He, that's somebody's generous. <laughs> so I mentioned at the beginning that people can call, follow you at widerquist.com. Is there anywhere else you would like people to follow your work? Uh, yeah, uh, if you're, um, um, uh, yeah, my, my, I, I post just about everything I write on widerquist.com. So if you can spell my name, you can find that. Um, spelling, it's the issue. White, W-I-D-E-R-Q-I-S-T. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, for as long as that lasts, um, I will leave Twitter when they start charging money for it. Um, and, and, um, the, uh, I'm on Twitter at Carl Weiderquist. Um, and I'm on Twitter. I have a whole bunch of, uh, Twitter contacts, um, who are I interested in basic income. Of course, Scott Sands, but many others, um, uh, uh, and, uh, so if you want to look into basic income stuff through through who I'm following on Twitter. That's that's one good way to look at it. Look for it. Um, then, uh, let's see, Twitter. And then I have a Facebook page um, called Independentarianism, which is what I call my political theory. So you could follow the Independentarianism page on uh, on Facebook. Also difficult to spell because it's not Independentarianism. It's just Independentarianism, making it as simple as you can make such a cumbersome word. But independence is so important to the political theory that I write. Um, I figured that was, that was the only name for it that seemed to be appropriate. So, uh, so you got those three, those three ways to follow me. Perfect. And, and I'm also, Oh, for those people who are getting into blue sky, uh, which hasn't officially launched yet, but if you're on blue sky, uh, I am also, you can find me at Carl Weiderquist on blue sky. Any closing, uh, any closing thoughts for you, Southie? Um, <clears throat> No, uh, there's a lot for us to kind of digest. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, there's other questions that we could ask, but um, I think we have plenty of fodder for the, the next interview. So thank you, Carl. Thank you for tuning me from. I, I do have one more thing. When you're asking me about the entrepreneurs, okay, uh, I think you also might might want to be a little more optimistic about those that that starting entrepreneur that starts a business by themselves and then they want to go hire their first employee. I think a lot of those people want to pay living wages and give good working conditions to those people. And I'll go back to Franklin Roosevelt, who said uh, when, when they were trying to get a minimum wage, it was actually livable. Uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt said something to, I can't remember the exact quote. I need to look this up again, but Franklin Roosevelt said, if your business, oh, well, I can't do an imitation of his voice, but he said, if your business model um, requires your employees to live in poverty, we don't want your business in this country. I, I can disagree with that. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. As a, you know, starting up a business, you know, imagine being able to maybe galvanize people to, yeah. join your, to, to join your company, to join your movement. Mm -hmm. Um and not being able to pay them. I mean, that's that's it's kind of a bummer today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you can also you have other things you do. You can you can say, well, you've got I've got my basic income. You've got yours. Uh, I could pay you. I could pay you in stock options. And as a matter of fact, this is how I hired my brother. Um, is when when he was working part time. Um, when he was working part time for somebody else, he didn't really need more income. Okay, for every for every hour of work, you get so much ownership of the company. Mm -hmm. um and you know people can do that with any employee they have you know give them a stock option or something like that right, right. yeah mm -hmm. an option on future for profits sure. you know for sure there's a lot of creative so get people to and you know get you're living off your basic income but you're working for uh someday ownership in this business now that's not gonna work for every entrepreneur that will work for some right, right, right. fantastic 
Uh, this was this was amazing. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for thanks for asking me. Always enjoy talking about these topics.